We were doing it. Was, okay. All right. I expect you to count. Why would I count? Sorry. Sorry. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Um, all right. So uh, here we are, um, and it is um, uh, it is Sunday night. So let's talk about Napoleon, because uh, um, it's every day is Napoleon Day because he's the best, and I love him. Mm. So. Um, can 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 you hear me, Stephanie? What? Well, Stephanie's watching, so I want to make sure that you oh. are able to hear Can can you hear me, people who are watching, Stephanie in particular? Yes. I kind of figured there was a lag. It's cool. All right. All right. Um, I don't want to do that. Okay, so. So let's talk about Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon was born in um, 1769, and he's Corsican, um, right? And and he was born just a little while after Corsica became part of France. So that's sort of a big deal, right? Um, all right, so why is Napoleon important? Well, like all military dudes who uh, kick a lot of ass, um, Napoleon is fascinating, right? I mean, like Alexander the Great kind of stuff, right? Genghis Khan. But he, he actually changed a lot. Like a lot of Europe changed because of Napoleon. And for the British, he was a big deal because they, they felt like they, were, they really were the prime mover in the defeat of Napoleon, uh, right? And, and of course, um, it has... Um, all right. Uh, it has, um, there's a lot of great popular culture, of course, involving Napoleon. Um, but he, he was this sort of influential guy who really altered the power dynamics of the European continent and um, all, became kind of inextricably associated for a lot of Europeans with the, the spread of the ideals of the French Revolution, right? So Napoleon grows up on Corsica, and it's it's very um, like stereotypically Italian, like Southern Italian. There's all these families fighting, you know, feuds and stuff, and everybody's got 42 cousins and 17 siblings. It's the it's the mafia, yeah, for the mafia. And so Napoleon goes to a military school in in France, and he was you know a pretty good student. Well, I, we have I have in a book um, uh, some of the exercise sheets that he did, like the uh, the ph the phonics workbooks or whatever the handwriting exercises that he did. And he wrote a little poem and drew a little drummer man on the page. And the biography of Napoleon that I have uh, put uh, put it in the book. And um, Napoleon gets out, and he was mocked by the way by the French for his Corsican accent. Apparently, he was he was made fun of for for speaking French in a provincial way, which is very common. In the French, they, the uh, the French elite think that uh, grammatically correct spoken French is is what it is spoken in Paris, uh, right? Like the British had BBC voice in the 20th century, where the way they spoke on the BBC, which is the way they speak in London, is the correct way to speak English, right? Uh, not not which is not true because obviously we don't speak that um, garbage nonsense in America. We don't we don't have queens. Uh, that's right. Uh, there is no you in color, armor, or honor. And I will die on that hill, which is called Bunker Hill, and won't die on it because we'll kill British soldiers on it. And Nabor, no, mm -mm, Favor, mm, hard pass, uh, right? It's also not a loo, and I won't be drinking a pint. Uh, and so, I mean, I will drink a pint, but we will call it a beer, uh, right? Then when it's in a glass, where the measurement is a pint. Well, we just call it a beer. That's fine. We'll call it that. Uh, I'm not calling. I won't call it. I also won't drink it hot. No, mm, hard pass. I would like food with my beer, which they don't do. So get out of here. Yeah, anyway. So Napoleon, he goes to... Go back to the... What's that? Go back to the pyramids, baby. They were drinking it when they made them. No, it was beer because um, it's um, um, they they were making like a beer like a like a wheat slurry that was like partially fermented beer that they would just like kind of eat with a spoon. Um, what's I mean beer? So anyway, uh, Napoleon gets out of military school and he had gone into artillery and he actually thought for a while about serving in the British Navy, which is just sort of hilarious. Might have been what if Napoleon ended up as a as a lieutenant, uh, which is the way that they say it wrong in the British Navy, um, and had been on like a frigate or something. Um, in the 1790s, right? But it didn't happen. Um, 
So Napoleon ends up in the artillery and he ends up in the French army. And um, just as you might imagine when he's coming of age, you know, when things are beginning to go for him, um, he, the French Revolution happens, right? And everything is just kind of thrown into chaos, right? The, the revolutionaries, uh, they kick out the king and then the king gets executed and then the, uh, the, 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 the French get invaded by the, um, uh, the Prussians and the, uh, the Austrians and there are these plots about the royals are trying to come back. The king's brother, the Duc d'Orléans, is across the border in Metz. In Germany, trying to organize conspiracies to get the murderers of his uh, his brother and um, his brother's wife, and the Emperor of Austria's his sister was murdered by the revolutionaries, and the guillotine Marie Antoinette, uh, right? Who never said let them eat cake. By the way, that was a 19th century fabrication. Uh, and so, well, she said brioche, which is the French word for bread. Although when you order brioche today, it's not what we call bread. It's like a different kind of bread. But in the 19th century, in the 18th century, she would have she would have been saying just give them bread. Uh, right, which is also some historian admitted to just putting that quote in her mouth to make her seem bad, which is there's a lot of reasons you can make Marie Antoinette to be a jerk face. That's not one of them. Uh, and so there, everything in France is kind of out the window. Right. The, the noblemen and royalists are fleeing the country. Uh, prisoners are getting freed from jail. The Catholic Church is getting banned. Um, and sort of nobody really kind of knows what's going on. Right. And Napoleon rises to the top in this incredibly kind of fluid environment where, you know, everything is kind of no one knows what's going to happen. No one knows what's going on, right? Old social institutions that have been dominant in France for hundreds of years are getting tossed out. And, you know, so uh, what happens is the French revolutionary government finds itself in need of a professional army, uh, right? And um, it, it, later on in the, the French revolutionary wars, they recruited everybody into the army. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a minute. In the beginning, what they had done is they needed a professional army to put down cities that had revolted against the revolution. The French Revolution was primarily popular in metropolitan Paris uh, and among the Paris mob. And so when conservative rural parts of Western and Southern France revolted, primarily over the French government's banning of the Catholic Church, for example, the anti-clericalism of the revolution, uh, they, they revolted and the French revolutionary government crushed them. And of course, the irony of a revolution crushing other revolutionaries is of course not lost on people at the time, and of course we t talk about Animal Farm and the the the, the Leninists and the Stalinists and the Russian Revolution, right? But um, uh, Napoleon's first big outing is with the siege of the city of Toulon, um, and they actually they send him along as an artilleryman, and he does a really good job. He there's a, a hill outside the city that's got uh, d rebel artillery on it, and he comes up with a plan to capture the artillery, and he presents it to them, and they think it's going to fail. But they're like, well, this crazy guy do it. And he, he goes and does it. Um, and uh, he gets wounded in the leg and, um, and it works. And he, and he succeeds in defending, um, uh, the, the capturing the artillery. And it was, it was this big deal. And so, um, and so um, uh, Napoleon ends up, um, Napoleon ends up sort of at loss, at loss ends. He sort of, they, they furlough him because of his injury. And, the the, uh, the the government like doesn't trust him. They they just sort of don't know him very well. And at the same time, we got to mention the the change in the French army that happens, which is what's called in French the levée en masse, uh, right? And so uh, when the French revolutionaries have their army that they need to defend against the invading Prussians and the Austrians, they mobilize something that's unheard of in the history of the world. They the entire population of France is called out to sort of defend the revolution against these foreign enemies. And they say that uh, one of the, the, the members of the revolutionary government, he gives a speech and he says, uh, the young men will fight. Uh, the, the young boys will, um, uh, will gather up scrap metal. The, um, the, the women will make bandages in the, um, uh, um, in, in the hospitals and be nurses. And the old men will be wheeled out in their wheelchairs into the town squares to give patriotic speeches to inspire the fighters. And so the vision that the French have is that the entire French nation, not just the professional army that's a very you know, few thousand men, but like everybody will go and fight uh, the um, will go fight uh, in the um, uh, in the war. And, and it really it does. The French army that defeats the Prussians at uh, the Battle of uh, Valme um, actually is is a small core of French skilled French officers, professionals. But it's this huge mass of basically civilians who have been equipped very rapidly with makeshift weapons. And it's something that the Prussians and the Austrians are not prepared for. The, the, the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of soldiers is something that has not 
been seen on the field of battle since the Roman Empire or the Mongol invasion in the uh, the uh, uh, 13th century. And so, yeah. Is this post American Revolution? Yeah, it inspired yeah. the French Revolution because the French, yeah, and, and they and the our support of the are uh, the, the French supporting us meant that in the eyes of a lot of French people, like our success is because of them, and the ideas of the American Revolution kind of came back to France, you know. Um, and the most famous French soldier, the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, had fought in America alongside George Washington, was revered as a French national hero. My remember from Hamilton. Um, and so uh, uh, Lafayette came home and was a hero, not because he had served the king, but because he had fought for freedom for the Americans. And, and the king didn't like that. Louis XVI was sort of not, that's not what we were doing here, right? They, they weren't supporting the Americans because they loved us. They were supporting them because it was a way to get back at the British who were their enemies. Um, and so, yeah, the, the French Revolution inspired, was inspired by rather the American Revolution. The, the, the ideas of the Enlightenment were generated in Europe and then were actualized in America and then came back to Europe by way of the American Revolution into France. Um, yeah, and so, and like the idea of citizen soldiers like the American Revolutionary Army, the, 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 yeah, the militiamen who ended up joining the Continental Army, who were, the British thought that, that was just preposterous. I mean, farmers with dirt under their fingernails are gonna fight professional soldiers. That's so totally stupid. Uh, and yet, like, we did, right? We beat them, uh, right? We lost, but we also won, right? And it was many battles we lost, we won. And so uh, that was what the French were trying to realize is the, the concept of the entire nation coming together under the flag, you know, we're going to defend our republic from these enemies. And the French Revolutionary government was in the shit, to put it bluntly. They, the, the primary reason for the French Revolution was the economy failed, and the French government failed at managing the economy. The French Revolutionary government was, if anything, worse at managing the economy than the king, which is like the primary reason you're here is this and you stink at it. So the foreigners invading was like a godsend. It was a gift from God because all of a sudden we can be like, well, let's not talk about the economy. Let's go kill foreigners who want to destroy our freedom, everybody in. And it also allowed them to uh, begin to mobilize the power of the government against their citizens, right? Because now if you didn't support the French Revolution, it wasn't a difference of opinion. You were an enemy of the state, right? I mean, you were a, a traitor who was, what do you, in league with the Austrians, you know? And so that's when they started really ha ramping up the executions of people and stuff. Uh, but Napoleon would use the, the Levé en masse because in a way that was unprecedented in European history, his armies would contain hundreds of thousands of men um, in, in a way that they had not uh, done uh, before, right? Hmm. So Napoleon is really at wit's end. And there's a restaurant in Paris you can go to. And he allegedly lived near this restaurant for a while. And if you go to the restaurant in the window, they have a big circular window and it's a glass window and there's this big tattered leather hat in the window. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and so uh, if you go in there, they will tell you that that's Napoleon's actual hat. And then at one point when he was really in his in his dumps, um, he um, he he gave them his hat and said, I, I will pay you back um, if you just let me eat in return. You can take this hat. And uh, when, of course, when he got famous, he paid them and they, they kept the hat because it was a souvenir. And so he was really kind of poor. And that's when things begin to get uh, bad. And this comes at a date uh, called the 13th of uh, Vendemir, uh, right? Which I want to say the 13th of Vendemir is like, like 1795. Um, and the French Revolution, they, they redid the calendar, uh, right? And so 13th Vendemir um, is, the, uh, is the moment when Napoleon, um, he sort of makes himself indispensable to the Republic. There's a rumor that a, uh, the royalists are going to mount a coup in Paris. And uh, the members of the, the guys running the French Revolution government, they're called the Directory. One of them is a guy called Barras. And Barras is very desperate. They're going to get overthrown. They're not popular. Things are bad. Uh, the violence in the streets is increasing. The reign of terror and the, the guillotine. And so they, 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 they sit down and have a meeting. We need someone to protect us who's loyal. And Barras is like, I, I know a guy. You know, I, know, I know a guy. And they call Napoleon. He's desperate. He's like Morgan. He's cut the buttons off his coat because they're brass, and he's like selling them. And they're like, "Do you think you can take command of the troops defending the Directory?" And Napoleon is like, "I got it." And so the next day, there's a coup. Oh, well, of course, what it means is a, is a, is a yeah, is a way back into favor, right? And so um, Barras elevates Napoleon, and Napoleon he looks at the plaza in front of the Directory building, and he realizes it's a wide open plaza, and so he gets cannons. And he mounts them on the steps of the directory. And when the, when the royalist mob and the, they come to overthrow the directory, he meets them with cannon fire. He says, I'll clear the street with one whiff of the grape, uh, meaning grape shot, which is a cannon shells that you put. You take uh, the gunpowder, you put it in, and then you dump a can full of nails and like musket balls into the cannon. When you fire it, 
Grape shot is very short range and it slows down very quickly when it leaves the barrel, but at close range, it is very lethal and at medium range, it's great for inflicting wounds and like scaring people and stuff. Yeah. Is that similar to the um, yeah, the the bombers, uh, the the Sarnayev brothers. They they. Yeah, she was asking about the guys in the Boston Marathon. They kind of made an improvised claymore bomb, um, and a claymore is an American military mine. It's shaped like a little sort of flat thing that's curved and it's on little stilts. But what it does is it fires a bunch of steel pellets, and it's anti personnel. It's designed for uh, hitting people who don't have body armor on, but it does like a lot of little tiny wounds that are very likely to hit them in the head or the limbs, so that they can't move or get disoriented. And so it's very similar to that, or like a like a like a buckshot out of a shotgun. Yeah, and it's like a shotgun with buckshot isn't going to penetrate armor, and it's not very good at long range, but it's very good for doing things like hitting an animal and inflicting like minor wounds because you don't want to hit an animal with like a big solid slug shotgun shell. You just tear a huge chunk in the meat that you're going to eat, right? And so canister shot is used for two things at, at on land at close range is great for large crowds of soldiers. And at sea, you can use it to rip holes in the sails of enemy ships so that the sail doesn't work and then uh, the ship stops. And then you can, you can attack the ship, at, uh, at, you know, you can sail around it in circles or whatever. And so, yeah, the principle is pretty much the same, right? Lots of little tiny things. And the, the Sarnia brothers of the Boston Marathon built pressure cookers and turned them into, they put explosives in the pressure cooker and turned a timer on, but they wrapped them in like plastic wrap full of nails and stuff. So when they blew up, that's what they would do is they would send out this like shrapnel. Is there a question? Is there a question? Yeah, Stephanie asked, um, isn't a claymore a sword? And pause for a second while I switch the mics back. Yeah, claymore is a two-handed, double-edged sword often used by uh, the Scottish. Uh, but it is also named, the name was used for the 20th century American anti-personnel uh, uh, mine, um, which is called a claymore. It's like a little... It's like a little flat metal thing that you can kind of hold in your hands and it's it's curved a little bit and it's got on the bottom little stilts and you put it down and usually they can be detonated. You have a, they have a little wire with a little trigger, a little paddle trigger that they use. But they, they stole the name from the from the, the sword, you know, the, the, the Scottish two-handed sword. Uh, the Germans called the sword the Zweihander, the two-hander. Uh, the Scottish called it the Claymore. So Napoleon, he, he saves the day, right? I mean, he... He defeats the mob. He gave him, Thomas Carlyle quoted him as saying he gave him a whiff of the grape. Uh, right? Thomas Carlyle is a Scottish historian who wrote uh, the first really serious history of the French Revolution. The history of the French Revolution is what it's called, and it's a very good. Uh, first English language history. Not the first English language take on the French Revolution. That belongs to uh, Edmund Burke. Uh, the, um, uh, what did he say? What was, what was Edmund Burke? Uh, Reflections on the Revolution in France, uh, which is, is the uh, political book about it, but is also the birth the birth testament of modern conservatism as an ideology. Um, and so uh, Carlyle wrote the first, it's like 1820, he wrote the first, like, this is a history of the French Revolution for you to read. And so um, uh, Napoleon becomes sort of indispensable. And it's very similar to Rome, right? Napoleon's political prominence means that they want to invade uh, Italy. Italy's rich, uh, Italy's powerful, Italy's the home of Austrian influence, and the French want to deal the Austrians a, a blow. So uh, Napoleon, Sort of like like Caesar is being appointed consul, right? Or Sulla and Marius in the first century BC, second century BC, are fighting over the right to be appointed consul. Napoleon's preeminence ensures that he is appointed consul, you know, the general to lead this invasion of Italy. And so uh, Napoleon does in the, the mid 1790s. He goes he goes to um, to Italy, uh, and he he to put it bluntly, he stomps the Austrians like it's nobody's business. Uh, right. And so this is the beginning of this sort of legend of Napoleon. Right. This this legend of, of uh, Napoleon's success. By the way, he brings with him to Italy um, uh, a young woman named Josephine de Bernays. And Josephine is a very beautiful woman um, who is the former mistress of Barras. And Josephine has an acute sense of um, who is rising and who is falling. And she is sleeping with Barras until this young Corsican artillery colonel comes along and then she drops um, uh, uh, Barras like a, like a third period French class and picks up Napoleon who is, uh, is on the rise uh, and she becomes Napoleon's longtime mistress, uh, right? Josephine is from uh, saint Dominique in the uh, Caribbean, Haiti in the Caribbean. She, her parents own a sugarcane plantation and they sent her to, to France for sort of, you know, finishing school and, and to make something of herself. And um, notably she has uh, bad teeth. Uh, her teeth are black. Um, it was too much sugarcane when she was a kid. Uh, no dental care. Um, and so uh, she's got all these pictures where she's got this Mona Lisa smile with her lips together and it's because she had bad teeth. So she, uh, she probably did. 
which is unusual because she would have a poodle, right, or a, a bulldog if she was, you know. But she was she was edgy, not not following convention, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, Stephanie uh, uh, says that suggests that um, uh, Josephine had a pug, which I believe because if there's an expert on pugs, it is Stephanie. Yeah. Napoleon hated the pug, according to Stephanie. Uh, likely, totally likely, Napoleon would hate that. It's it was a distraction from like his job or whatever. So why would he care about it? Yeah. So um, Napoleon in Austria, he stomps the Austrians um, and he invades and defeats them. And what can we say about Napoleon's military tactics? He had he had a few things he did. He he borrowed the levee in mass. This this mass mobilization of all the Frenchmen. And what Napoleon said about the soldiers is that every soldier walks with a field marshal's baton in his backpack. And so the soldiers knew that uh, if they um, if they fought hard, Napoleon would promote them. He 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 was just professional and un, un new in French history was this idea that Napoleon felt like um, you know all he cared about was competence. If you were good, you go up. If you fail, you're done. And the aristocratic French army, which had promoted people based on their birth, their their connections, that was gone. Napoleon didn't like it. He, he said, "I don't care where a guy comes from. I care if he fights. I care if he's confident." And so the French soldiers fought twice as hard, knowing that. If they if they did their jobs, they would be noticed, right? They would be promoted. And Napoleon, some of Napoleon's marshals came out of the ranks. Some of them were aristocrats. And if you asked Napoleon about it, he would say, "Look, I don't care where you come from. I don't care if you're the Duke of whatever. I don't care if you're a peasant farmer. If you know your job, uh, and I I'm qualified to say, then I will promote you, uh, right?" And so Napoleon also looted Italy, which did not hurt that they were invading one of the richest places on planet Earth, right? The the fabled cities of the northern Italian plain had been collecting loot from the Middle East for 500 years. A, a thousand years at this point, um, and uh, when they invade Venice, it, it ends uh, something like twelve hundred years of Venetian independence. Uh, when Napoleon invades it, and turns Venice into a protectorate. Uh, the La Repubblica Serenissima, the Serene Republic of Venice, uh, is brought to an end. And they loot, by the way, they loot these giant horses that were in front of Saint Mark's Cathedral that had actually come from the Byzantine capital of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade in twelve o four. And the Crusaders looted them and put them in front of St. Mark's, and Napoleon looted them and put them in front of something in France. And they, of course, they get taken back later. Not yeah, we don't, that. we don't call it, we don't call it Istanbul in this house. I will, I will not call it that. No, I saw you get all excited too. No, but we don't call it Istanbul because that's not the correct name of the city, and I refuse to respect the will of the Ottoman Sultans. I won't do it. I won't do it. No. Or he says, yeah, Napoleon loots, loots uh, Venice, among others, right, and gets fabulously wealthy. And uh, Napoleon, when they ask him about his success, uh, he says, uh, I, fought, I fought 60 battles, and I learned nothing through, throughout any of them that I didn't know at the beginning of the first one. And uh, look at Julius Caesar. He fought his last battle exactly like he fought his first. He is like me. Uh, and so, uh, it, it, what's that? Napoleon is a supremely arrogant guy, right? But on the other hand, he's not wrong. I mean, Napoleon fought, you know, 60 battles over the course of his, his early military career, and he didn't lose any one, uh, right? You can count the number of losses he had on one hand. Uh, there's a big one that he did lose, but we'll talk about it later. It's really sad. But um, what, are you, what are you saying? Uh, no, we, um, later, okay? <laughs> Give me my moment because uh, it's not for a while. But um, – but um, and I don't know why they would sing that song. It hurts when they say that name. But um, Napoleon was supremely arrogant. But on the other hand, like people who are really good at their job are entitled to a degree of arrogance. Right. I mean, Napoleon invaded Italy and he conquered northern Italy and also defeated the Austrians. I mean, the Austrians have an empire that goes back hundreds of years. Napoleon mopped the floor with them. Right? I mean, uh, and so what was the secret to Napoleon's success? Uh, the levee in mass was one. He mobilized this giant army. He had bigger armies than anybody. He also was really good at using local intelligence. He frequently paid locals for information about roads, uh, fords across rivers, food supply. Uh, that was a big thing. Uh, accurate intelligence gathering came into its own during the Napoleonic Wars. He also was really good about concentrating his armies. He would he would split them up um, in in small smaller units and then move them across the terrain rapidly and then concentrate them. And you never want to split your army in the face of a numerically superior foe because your foe will engage each little section of your army one at a time while it tries to collect together and you will be defeated, the phrase is defeated in detail. 
which is what happened in the 1777 Battle of Saratoga to gentleman Johnny Burgoyne in upstate New York, which is, of course, why the French came in the American Revolution, is because Burgoyne got defeated in detail by, um, uh, among others, Gates. Uh, right? On the other hand, uh, uh, Robert E. Lee, uh, not my favorite individual, he broke his army in half in, fa in front of the numerically superior armor of the Potomac in the spring of 1863 at Chancellorsville, and it worked. Uh, because he was a better general than Burgoyne. Uh, but Napoleon was always able to do this, and using his superior knowledge of the terrain, was able to concentrate his armies before engaging the enemy. He never got caught, metaphorically, with his pants down. Um, just with Josephine. Just with Josephine. Um, and, um, and that was a very, it was a very uh, big deal. Uh, right? he, was, he had this almost sixth sense about it, which was very significant. He was able to move his army, particularly for such a big army, he was able to move it further and faster than you would necessarily expect. Right? We should mention, by the way, throughout the Italian campaign, uh, a French nobleman uh, uh, cuckolded um, Napoleon with Josephine. And everybody everybody was like, it was an open secret. Everybody knew. Josephine carried on like it was no big deal. And they were they're like, Napoleon's going to hang this guy. He's going to skin him alive. You know? And Napoleon was so in love with Josephine that um, he just overlooked it. He was just besotted with her. Um, and at one point, I think it was Marshal Ney was one of Napoleon's marshals, and he thought he had this conversation with Napoleon. He was like, "This this woman is like a dead weight. She's she's a social climber. She's a gold digger. She doesn't really love you. When you're not around, she cats around with this guy, and when you're there, she loves you. You could do a lot better. You're my friend. You know, I respect you." And uh, he goes in to meet Napoleon, and they're like, "Oh, Napoleon's in bed, but you can go. He's reading his papers and stuff." And so Napoleon uh, or Ney goes in. Um, I think it was Nay, and he goes in, and uh, Napoleon and Josephine are under the blankets in front of the fire, and Napoleon is like reading his correspondence, and it was this very pointed signal, like it was a power play by Josephine. Like if you come in and you you meet Napoleon, and he's obviously in bed with me, like clearly we had a discussion about the sleeping around, and it didn't bother him, or he would have gotten rid of me, right? And so uh, wh whoever it was, I think it was Nay, but whoever it was never brought it up again. Uh, they were like, okay, you know, when the boss sleeps, when the boss's girlfriend sleeps around, and the boss doesn't care, you just keep your mouth shut. Uh, right, you want to keep your job. You're not. You're not here to pick a fight, uh, right? And so Napoleon wins in Italy, uh, right? He goes back, and there's a huge parade, uh, and he showers everybody with gold. And when someone asks him about it, he says, "The French people, they don't care. Uh, they only care about uh, deeds and not words. They will grow bored of me one day uh, when they when they haven't seen anything from me." And it's it's, it's a very surprising and uh, apt prediction from Napoleon, right? So uh, where do we go now? Uh, yeah, I gotta get some drinks. 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 Yeah, yeah, they did. Um, and that was, that's an intelligence gathering. Was it, what's that? Yeah. Oh, uh, Tim asked about, did Washington have a, a network of spies? He did. And intelligence gathering was a very, very primitive art. Um, and it was during the 17 and early 1800s when it became a very specific, very, you know, very big thing. The British in India had the All India Sur Survey or whatever they called it. Uh, where they gathered all this in demographic information, geographic information about India, which is by the Kickstarter, like uh, kickstarted like dozens of academic disciplines studying India, like Sanskrit and Hinduism and all this stuff. But uh, the reason the British wanted all this detailed information about India was in case India got invaded, they would need to know where the population centers and where's the geography and where can you afford the rivers and where you know where could you build railroads and stuff. And so they really turned it into this kind of fanatical thing where like we got to know everything about India. Which is this whole thing, subset of study the British Empire and the desire for the British to like nail everything down by learning everything about it, right? If you if you if you if you understand every fact, then you know it and you can understand it, right? But part of it was the British uh, East India Company's army was like, look, we just got to have maps and stuff, and we got to know like if the Russians invade, where can we concentrate our armies? And it was very like Napoleonic war kind of stuff, right? Uh, and like uh, the United States got its maps of the West from the railroads because the railroad companies paid for the best surveyors to come and, and, you know, survey the entire Great Plains. And so the U.S. Army, when they went after the Indians, bought the maps from the railroads uh, because they had the they paid for the best surveyors. Washington was a surveyor in um, um, in the uh, west of the Alleghenies in the 17, like 60, like 50s and 60s. Um, and he his bill was he surveyed the land and then also bought it. So when they extended the state west, he would then sell it at like double the price. Uh, and Lincoln actually got um, a, uh, a job surveying in Albemarle County in the 1830s from Andrew Jackson. Uh, yeah, Jackson uh, appointed him. Lincoln was uh, a Whig, but Jackson appointed him because he said everybody in the county likes like this guy, Abraham Lincoln. So 
you, you want you don't want to he said i want to pick a democrat i'm a democrat i'll pick a democrat but he said on the other hand if everybody likes a guy and he's a surveyor you don't want to rock the boat there because it make you look bad and so jackson understood that the surveyor had a certain degree of respect in the in the west right he was from tennessee himself right and so that was lincoln's first political appointee would point job was he um he would, ran a store but also became the county surveyor i mean talking about lincoln it's cool um and so alive at the same time the lincoln hasn't been born yet but so what does napoleon do he goes back to france and um he hatches this uh cockamamie scheme and he's like all right guys we need to do, we need to the british are a threat so we need to uh we need to invade egypt we need to invade egypt and i think napoleon's everybody's so, he's, he's so rich they, they made all this money in in in, in austria in italy and defeating austria uh, austria is defeated prussia is not on the board russia is not on the board the british are disorganized so i think the french guys are like look napoleon you do whatever you want i mean you do you i don't care we take an army do whatever fine and barras i think also expects napoleon to be um like if you go off the stage you will probably fail and then that will be good for all of us, right? You're a little too successful. So, so Napoleon embarks on this incredible crusade to go to Egypt and defeat Egypt. And they're gonna defeat the Egyptians and they're gonna seize Egypt and they use it as a base. And from Egypt, they can invade India from the West uh, because the British are holding India. The British are threatening the uh, French possessions in India. Yeah, I mean, now Egypt's to the West of India, right? It's like, there's some stuff in between, but it's you could basically just walk through that. I mean, it's fine. Uh, I mean, like, whatever, it's fine. It's, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. I don't even, like, it's like some debt. Yeah, I mean, it's like you get on a horse or whatever, it's fine, okay? It's like, we're not... It's not like they have races that travel that in. No, we're thinking big picture, okay? And so that's sort of Napoleon's idea, is is to create this threat on the western flank of the British possessions that are kind of coalescing in northern India, um, and sort of to, to threaten the British in, in this, in sort of, in, in this colonial way, right? And so... They attack uh, Egypt. Egypt is in the hands of a group of guys called the, um, the the Mamluk. Back in the Middle Ages, there was a caliphate in Egypt called the Fatimid. They claimed to be descended from Muhammad's wife uh, Fatima. And um, there's a term. There's a term in, in Arabic you use for somebody who claims to be descended from the Prophet's family. I don't remember what it is. But the, the Fatimids were overthrown by the Mamluks, and the Mamluks actually had this interesting idea. So in Muslim theology, Muslims are not supposed to kill Muslims. And that's why terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda or ISIS, they spend a lot of time engaging in a process called takfir, where you declare other people who are supposedly Muslims are bad Muslims, so it's okay to kill them. They're not, they're not really Muslims. It doesn't really, the prohibition against killing your fellow co-religionists doesn't really apply. Um, and so... Uh, it's totally fine, which, of course, raises serious questions like who is qualified to just suggest that someone is not Muslim? And the answer is really religious authorities with a greatly respected pedigree, which none of the terrorist guys, you know, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who was head of ISIS, or Osama bin Laden is head of al-Qaeda. They were not really qualified to issue those kind of pronouncements. And actual religious authorities tend to be very careful about that. Right. I mean, if you start throwing that around, that's pretty heavy. Uh, but the uh, the Mamluks got around this prohibition by getting slaves from Africa and arming them and training them how to fight and then using them as soldiers. So it's like it's totally not the same as if you say to this black guy, you're like, all right, I can't kill the fellow Muslim. Right. But you can if I tell you and then I leave and then it's like I don't even know what happened. You know, whatever. It's fine. Right. And the African guy would just go do it. And you're like, all right, whatever. I guess he fell out on some bullets or something. Right. Um, it's really stupid because after like a little while, the African slaves were like, you know, like we have all the guns and like we're the soldiers and like, why don't we just kill the slave owners? And you can imagine like the barracks full of African guys like thinking about it. Yeah. They, like, you know, like, I don't know, like, you know, he makes a good point. What do you guys think? And they're all like, ah, a, yeah, well, I mean, like, I don't really want to be a slave anymore. So they rise up and overthrew the uh, the Mamluk sultans and took over Egypt. And it was really stupid. And right. That's that's why there was a really good reason why the American Southerners had laws restricting the access of, of African-American slaves to firearms. Right. It's, 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 it, it seems really obvious in retrospect. Right. Like you would not you would not want the guy you habitually whip or whatever to have a gun that he would use on you or whatever so anyway, napoleon attacks egypt and he lands his troops in the nile and he marches south 
and he gets all the way to Giza where the pyramids are. And the Mamluks rally this big army of, of guys to fight him. And there's these great scenes where um, the, um, the, um, the, uh, uh, the French army, they're gathered in the pyramids, right? And the French soldiers have apparently been shooting at this buried head in front of the pyramids, the, uh, the Sphinx. They've been shooting at it for target practice, and Napoleon told them to stop, which is why the Sphinx has no nose, according to the stories. And um, they uh, – what? It's a, it was a cool nose. I mean, according to the latter, because Jasmine Aladdin survived that. Oh, I mean, according to – there's a lot of things in Disney movies that are wrong, like, for example, everything in Hercules and Pocahontas. So we don't talk about those movies. Yes. We're not. I mean, if we talk about Pocahontas, it's going to be about why the Disney movie is, is abominable, and we don't we don't like it, right? Or, or I mean, <laughs> the trick is you just don't make movies about real people, right? I mean, like Hercules isn't real, but there's like stories about Hercules, so like you could make the movie, but don't make movies about people that have already had stories made about them that people might be familiar because like Mulan is also a character, but nobody in nobody in, in outside of China knows the story of Mulan, the heroic Tang Dynasty woman who disguised herself as a man and joined the army. And in, in, in Milan, she fights the, the, the uh, Huns. She wouldn't have fought the Huns. It would have been somebody else. It would have been like the Jurchen or somebody. Uh, but of course, it doesn't really sound great if you, like, the Jurchen have invaded. And everybody's like, what the fuck is that? Uh, and so the trick is just don't make stories about Pocahontas, a person who we know actual facts about. And, like, you could just get them wrong, right? I mean, like, just it just seems low effort, right? Uh, for example, Moana is a fictional character, and you just say whatever you want. It's like, Right, and she, well, she did, yeah. And also, that's an actual mythological story from the Polynesian uh, mythology. But they they actually hired literal Polynesians, and they were like, "Tell us about your mythology, and we'll and like we'll also look at this movie we made and tell us if it's insulting." And they did. Whereas, like, they didn't do with the Native Americans in Pocahontas. They didn't like ask them about that. So, just just disappointing. What? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I just anyway, I don't like Pocahontas. I don't like Hercules. So I'm just saying. Yeah, so we don't. So anyway, uh, Napoleon um, is in in front of the pyramids, and the Mamluks have this big army. And the the the, the famous speech he gives him, he tells the soldiers, he says, "Soldiers, uh, you stand in the shadow of greatness. Forty centuries of history stare upon you, uh, because of course, talking about the the, um, the the pyramids, right, which were which were completed in the in the uh, the Egyptian old kingdom in the 2000s BC, uh, and so." Um, and so uh, they defeat the Mamluks. It was it was it was unbelievable. The the, the French soldiers formed squares of men with with uh, the bayonet, the bayoneted muskets, and the the Mamluks charged them on horseback and they just massacred them. They suffered like forty casualties. And so Napoleon's the master of Egypt, um, right? But there's two things you got to talk about. Uh, well, three. The first is Napoleon actually uh, um, jump started the study of ancient Egypt before Napoleon's armies. Ancient Egypt was this very mysterious thing. Nobody knew a lot about it. The only sources you had to study ancient Egypt were Greek. Sources. There was the um, uh, Manetho was the great Greek priest who wrote the book uh, about Egypt, and so uh, the translation of hieroglyphs and all this Egyptian information was really unknown. Did you have a, do you have a question? Uh, who discovered the Rosetta Stone? French soldiers. Okay. And so, and so Napoleon brought all these scholars um, and to study Egypt because it was a very enlightenment thing of like this mysterious land that has this great fascination for the Greeks and Romans that we don't know anything about. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna study it, right? And he brought like botanists and zoologists and like geographers and like engineers and like um, all sorts of people to study every aspect of Egypt. And uh, they did this big book called the Description de l'Egypte, the Description of Egypt. And it was full of these drawings of like the pyramids and all the monuments and stuff. And the Brit the French soldiers they found the Rosetta Stone. And it's a it's a uh, it's an inscription from like the third century BC. And it's um, uh, uh, some sort of um, government edict or something, but it's in hieroglyphic, demotic Egyptian and uh, and Greek and and, uh, and Greek. And the and the, the scholars who studied it figured, oh my God, if this is the same thing three times, then you could use we could translate the Greek. We we know Greek, and then you could use that to translate the demotic and the hieroglyphic Egyptian. And they were right; they were correct. It was it was the same thing. It was like you go to an airport and they have a sign. It's like bathroom this way, and it's in like five languages, and it was exactly the same thing. And so uh, Napoleon's invasion led to the modern study of ancient Egyptian history and culture for the first time. Um, and the book they published in, um, in, uh, in France, The Description of Egypt, had all this information about um, uh, Egyptian culture and stuff that everybody was sort of gaga for. They did all this art and they did all this, this aesthetic stuff in French art. 
and they did Cleopatra's needle in in Paris. They they, they took the obelisk and they put it in a ship and put it in in the, um, and all this sort of fascination with ancient Egypt, uh, mummies and stuff. Um, uh, and, and of course, the Rosetta Stone is in the British Museum today because the British totally shamelessly looted it from the French. So if you can go see it, it's in London. Um, yeah, and every time the uh, the uh, Egyptians are like, "Hey, can we have back this priceless cultural artifact from our?" and the British are like, "We can't hear what you're saying. It's, we don't, it's like have what back? I sorry, I have to go." Um, right, just like the, the the Greeks with the Elgin marbles, and the British are like, straight up, straight up hard pass. What's that? New phone who dis? Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you, are you sneaking by? Do you want to, what are you doing? Yeah, you're fine. You can just rock right on. Do you want to go over the thing, over the back of the couch? Can you do it? Can you do it? Can you do it? I think you can do it. Hold on. I'll give you a boost. Get up there like you were doing. Get that leg up there. Going up. Whoa! Boom. All right. Um, and so, um, that's why it's kicking in. It feels good. <laughs> All right, it's like 2020 isn't so bad anymore. Just kidding. Um, and so, too soon, too soon to be. It won't be too soon on January 1st. Um, and so, uh, having said that, uh, that's that's a big thing. If you study Egyptology and you study ancient Egyptian culture, it really the modern study of Egyptology dates from Napoleon's invasion, which is really fascinating, um, and is is really it's a significant thing. Um, and so anyway, um, uh, uh, the other thing about Napoleon is that the British decide that this is, this is a moment. Now the British have been on the sidelines for a while. Uh, they've been thinking that like Napoleon represents a threat, the unification of all of Western Europe under a single power, France, um, under a single French power. Uh, anybody could do it. France, anybody could do it. It could be any France. It could be anybody. Is the it's France. It could be France. Right up until 1914, when it could be the fucking Germans, and that's when British policy to France changes because all of a sudden it's, it's the Germans you got to watch out for, not the French. Uh, but for like 500 years of, of British history, the, the 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 main enemy is France, right? And and the French were represented a threat to British because they could unify everything from uh, the uh, the Bay of Biscay all the way up to uh, the Heligoland Bight. Uh, could become French territory, thus threatening England with a naval invasion that they could basically not resist. And so uh, the British decide to get off the, the bench and do something about Napoleon while he's in Egypt. Yes? Is that because England is an island off the coast? The, France yeah, has the, borders with 10 the, the, the French are always the power, the right? Choice the sea and sea. and the, the big worry the English have is if you, if you launch an invasion of England, the chance for them to stop it is before the soldiers land in England. And if the soldiers put their feet in England, they're probably going to win. The English coast is all flat. There's almost nowhere you couldn't land troops and have them march wherever they wanted. The Thames is navigable from Kent all the way up to London by deep water ocean ships. So you can't defend that. Um, and so most invasions of England succeed. And there's some exceptions, like 1688 succeeded, 1066 succeeded, uh, 1743 did not succeed. Uh, but the, the, the trick the English have that in their head is stop them before they start. Which is how they like 1940 with the Germans. They they uh, the Battle of Britain stopped the German invasion before it started because if the Germans had landed troops, they, I mean they just could have marched on London. There couldn't be a way to stop them. And so the British view this is the number one thing the British lie awake at night worrying about is if somebody controls the entire coast of Europe, they could launch a, a huge invasion because they have a big army. They have all the resources of that entire area to funnel into building ships and fighting the British. And they don't need to be very good. They just need to. I mean. If you have more ships than the British have, you can tie the British fleet up and then sail the invasion fleet around it, right? And the barges for the soldiers, they don't need to be very good. You can literally see England from France, right? I mean, you can stand in the French coast and you can see England on a clear day. And it's like, you know, like 10 miles or something. I mean, it's like you can swim it um, if you're skilled. Um, and so, I mean, that's like for the British, that's pretty scary. And so this is when they decide like this Napoleon guy, like, I do some of this shit. I don't know about that. And so uh, the guy who does it is the second greatest British prime minister. Okay, top three British prime minister. William Pitt the Younger. Yeah. The other two would be William Pitt the Elder and uh, Winston Churchill. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much no question on that. Um, and so, you, I mean, you can have your opinion about the rest of them. And like Macmillan is all right. And uh, um, Attlee with National Health Service or whatever. Um, and the Victorian prime minister, what's that? 
Glad, I mean, I like Gladstone when he wasn't um, whipping himself for having um, sex with underage prostitutes that he rescued and rescued in the streets. Um, I mean, he was all right, I guess. And you got to love Disraeli. Remember, Bismarck said about Disraeli, that old Jew, he's a man, uh, which is like mm, anti-Semitic, but mm, OK. Victoria liked uh, Disraeli. And when he came in to meet with her, she would put a chair in the meetings because he had bad knees. Um, and when Gladstone came in, she would make him stand up because she didn't like him. And she's a little bit petty. This is a little, this is a little bit petty. A little bit petty. Um, but I mean, I liked Israeli and Gladstone because they had this great rivalry. But unquestionably, the three greatest British prime ministers are Pitt the Elder, Pitt the Younger, and um, and and Churchill. No question. And, um, and and I mean, like even even Wellington was a great general, but he was no prime. Is no good prime minister. He's a douchey prime minister. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Cope is pointing out that Churchill is one of the greatest PMs, but was unable to be reelected after World War II. No, no and I mean, it's sad because Churchill was it was an absolutely wonderful PM, but the British people were just sick of it. They were sick of the whole war and the blood, sweat, toil and tears, you know, uh, and it, they just wanted they wanted a break. And, and Churchill was a symbol of the war years. It wasn't so much him personally as it was what he represented was this sacrifice that they had all made. And so they booted him out. Yeah, they voted him in. And famously joked that the queen wanted to knight him. And he said, I don't need the order of the garter. I got the order of the boot instead, right? And they elected him again in the 50s, but it was like for two minutes. It was it, it didn't last, um, right? And yeah, and so yeah, that, that's a tragedy. And Churchill felt that that was a personal rejection. He felt that they rejected him. But it, I know it was it rejected. They rejected what Winston Churchill meant. They rejected what the, the war years had meant. To, and of course, Macmillan, not my mills, Clement Attlee. It was Clement Attlee. It was Labor Party's Clement Attlee. He wanted, he wanted to national health service and he wanted to rebuild the country and improve people's standard of living. The war is over, right? Let's, let's do something else. And the British people, they went for it, right? I mean, that, you can understand why a British person in 45, when it was like barely, the war is like barely even over, right? I mean, it's like the, the, you know, that was it. And so Churchill goes off and writes books and, and a special relationship and all that stuff. Well, yeah. I mean, why we're talking about stuff? It's fine. Um, so, uh, um, uh, okay, so we got to talk about the Nile and Abu Kubay. So the British decide to send the Navy. They decide to send the Navy in and attack the French Navy with all the supply ships in the, in the, the Nile Delta. And they fight a couple battles, Abu Kir Bay and the Battle of the Nile. And this is important because it witnesses the rise of the most significant British person ever, Admiral Horatio Nelson. Admiral Nelson uh, Lee is not, he's at the battle of the Nile Abu Kirbe, but this is like the beginning of his ascent to national prominence. And so they attack the British and Nelson, uh, well, I mean, you're laughing. Why are you so excited? Why are you so excited? I love Admiral Nelson. Who doesn't get revved up talking about Admiral Nelson? It's, he's the best. And so Nelson's thinking is that you, go, you always go all in aggression, go close, get close, stay close, maximum damage. You're here to fight. Let's fight. Uh, yeah, he's, he's the U.S. grant of British naval admirals. And so uh, and he's not one of these guys who is like, oh, do we risk the fleet? Nelson's like, look, if we've got the fleet and we're here and we're fighting a battle. Let's do it. Uh, that's what we're just sort of job is go home or fight. And so when they hit the they hit the French, Nelson actually urges the commander of the British expedition to go all in. He's like, look, we have a chance to surprise them. We can inflict maximum damage. We start causing ships and they're going to be burning and stuff. We could sink. It will be confusing. We can inflict as much damage. And Nelson's big thing also is don't go for complicated. Get the ships in as close as they can and then give each admiral the discretion to do what he thinks is best. Right. Just to say each captain, you know, your ship, you know what you're doing. Pick a target, sink it, pick another target, sink it, pick another target, sink it. When you're out of when you're out of grape shot, when you're out of ammunition, board a French ship. Uh, right. And then, you know, if we just fight hard, we'll carry the day. And so at Abu Kir Bay and the Nile, the, the British stage a huge victory. They defeat the, the French Navy. They sink Napoleon's Navy. And the good story is Nelson apparently gets injured in the eye. He gets like a splinter in his eye. And they pull it out and they bandage it. And the, the Na British Commodore is saying, raising the semaphore flags for go home. Like retreat, 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 pull back. We've already, we've already done enough damage. And Nelson is, is signaling go forward. And his second mate is like, or first mate or whatever, is like, oh, hey, Captain, you know, the, 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 the admiral's saying we should, we should retreat. And Nelson, he's, he's got the signal on the ship. And Nelson pulls out the telescope and he points it at the flags and holds it up to his injured eye. And he puts it on and says, truthfully, I did not see the signal to go back. I didn't see it. And so Nelson is like full speed ahead, engage the enemy. And, uh, and it, it works. It's beautiful, right? I mean, they sink a ton of French ships. Uh, they strand the French in Egypt. And Nelson goes back to Naples and then Sicily, where he ends up sleeping with a Sicilian noblewoman and getting involved in a whole love triangle 
which is really the British are very on the one hand they love him. On the other hand, it's like you know, like maybe we just a little more church and a little less extramarital sex. And Nelson's like, whatever, I do what I want. What was it, Copenhagen? Was that is that a Copenhagen where he sees the thing? I thought it was Abu Kirbe. Copenhagen is 1801, where the the British sink the Danish fleet because they are worried the Danes are going to join the Napoleonic Wars on the side of France, and they sink 15 um, they sank 15 uh, Danish ships in uh, like in, a, in an afternoon. Uh, and if, if 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 I'll look it up. If Nelson was at uh, said that with the I thing at, at Copenhagen, I will issue a retraction. But I thought it was at Abu Kirbe. I thought it was at Abu Kirbe. Uh, but I could I could be wrong. I could be wrong. This is from a guy who admitted one time he was Sir Francis Drake, so he knows uh, ships of wood, men of iron. That's what he told me. I don't know. Are you looking it up? Um, uh, just look up. Uh, oh, yeah, look up. Look up. Look up. Battle of Copenhagen. Yeah, this is a good Wikipedia article about it. Um, okay. All right. Never mind. It was it was a Copenhagen, but it was a good story about Nelson, so I stand by it. Um, and so what can we say about Napoleon? Well, he, he says to his men, they're like, oh, you know, shit, we got stranded in Egypt. And Napoleon's like, it's fine. If you know the map, we can just march to France. We just go, we go Palestine, Turkey, France. It's like, it's just, they're connected. Okay. And they, what's that? We don't know. You know, I mean, they wouldn't go through that anyway or whatever. I don't know. So they, they actually march all the way to, it's like in today, it's like in Israel somewhere. And uh, they're dying in the desert. They're like all does thirst and stuff. And then, I'm not kidding, Black Plague breaks out. They start getting the plague. And that's when Napoleon is like, all right, guys, I have to get back. And so you guys are going to march back. And it's fine. It's fine. Uh, yeah, just keep going. And if you cough or whatever, I mean, just, you know, like in your elbow. And he gets a ship back. <laughs> six, yeah, six feet. And put on a paper face mask. And so he takes a boat back to France and gets away, and his army basically dies in the desert, and which is not super great, right? Um, it's about Black Plague. Black Plague, which is 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 her favorite thing ever, which is totally a, a pugs and plague, although not necessarily at the same time. Yeah, not not plague ridden pugs. That's not the dogs with the plague in their mouth, and when they bite, they bark, and you get the plague. <laughs> that, that's on my card for September. Yeah, that'll be coming, right? Uh, so hopefully Hawk will get that classic Simpsons reference. And so uh, having said that, Napoleon goes back. Uh, there's some fighting in Austria uh, at the same time. Uh, and then uh, Napoleon decides, or there's fighting in, in Italy again with the Austrians, but whatever, they defeat them. And th so this is when Napoleon declares himself, this is this important moment. This is, this is the moment, they call it the 18th day of the month of Brumaire, the 18th of Brumaire. And there, Karl Marx wrote was a journalist before he was an, uh, an economic uh, guy and a political theorist, and he wrote some really good books. One of them uh, was uh, called The 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon, and it's this classic work of political satire comparing Louis Napoleon, who became Napoleon III, um, to Napoleon I, who was, of course, Louis Napoleon's relative, right? And uh, Karl Marx coined his dictum uh, famously, history doesn't uh, – repeats itself history repeats itself the first time is tragedy the second time is farce uh right and if you know louis napoleon it's, it's farce is right and so this is the first one of the 18th brumaires uh, and what napoleon does is he stages a coup right and there's uh to put it very bluntly they go into the chamber of deputies and napoleon marches in and it's like all right guys i was victorious in egypt we won we defeated the mamluks and someone is like what about the british fleet and he was like what about shut up how about that? How about a little bit of that? And so apparently the, the deputies erupt, they're shouting, and Napoleon is hustled out, and he says at some point that someone pulled a knife on me. And so the story is the soldiers go in and arrest all the deputies because they're too rowdy. And what it is is it's a coup, right? Uh, when Napoleon was plucked out of obscurity, the directory needed Napoleon. Now Napoleon is calling the shots. Now it's Napoleon who won. He's the one that wins victories in Italy. He's the one that wins victories in Egypt. He's the one that wins victories in Italy. He's the one that conquers everything. And all of a sudden he comes in and he's like, hey, directory, you're not very popular. What if we get rid of you and replace you with me and I'm awesome and I'm a winner and you're a bunch of stupid losers? And the directory just doesn't have, they can't do anything, right? So Napoleon, he says, I'm not a dictator. I am not a king. We're not having that. I am... Uh, the uh, the first consul. I'm the first consul, uh, and it's it's totally not. It's I'm it's I'm not a dictatorship. That would be weird to say. It's not a king either. And so Napoleon basically makes himself the ruler of um, of France. 
And this is where things get interesting. Napoleon does a few things that are fascinating. Napoleon, um, he, he, he reconciles France with the Catholic Church. Uh, the, the biggest source of friction between the French uh, Revolution and most of France and the French government and the Catholic Church, and in fact, between the French Revolution and conservatives, was the French Revolution's banning of the Catholic Church. And um, the, the uh, con civil constitution of the clergy, they called it, where basically the French government nationalized the Catholic Church. And it, it would be a very fateful thing because the, um, the French uh, Revolution's embrace of atheism and anti-clericalism and secularism would be a thing that would lead the Catholic Church in the late 19th century to align itself uh, you know, in, a, in opposition to the modern age. The, the, French, uh, the, the Catholic Church basically said modernity, like democracy, civil society, secularism, uh, industrialization, uh, the spread of liberal values like personal freedom and free speech. And, and this, these things are bad and we oppose them, right? We, we reject them entirely. And so uh, it, it led to the, uh, the syllabus of errors, which is the doctrine in the 18, like 80s, where the Catholic Church argued that when the Pope speaks, he is guided by God and thus cannot make mistakes. He is, is papal infallibility, right? And it was under the doctrine of the syllabus of errors that the Catholic Church announced that the modern, the modern ideology of secularism and democracy was opposed to the teachings of the Catholic Church. And the reason that they did that is because the French Revolution is the beginning of the modern age, and the French Revolution was seen as being anti-Christian, anti-Catholic. And so Napoleon, didn't want, he, he, Napoleon, he's a total utilitarian. He privately thought religion is stupid, and it's for people who are stupid. And if you're religious, I guess you do what you want, but it's dumb, and you can be dumb. I, I can't stop you. And the Catholic Church is stupid. It's full of stupid people. I don't care. But on the other hand, he thought the Catholic Church is useful, right? I mean, it's, it's useful. People believe in it. So you should at least give it some lip service, right? It's not going to kill you to go out and say Catholic, the Catholic Church is okay, I guess, or whatever. And so Napoleon cuts a deal with the French, uh, with the Catholic Church, where the sort of France comes back into the Catholic Church. Although in reality, Napoleon is still in control of the Catholic Church. It's just not banned. Um, and of course, the ultimate, I think it was Paul Johnson's historian who said the ultimate example of this is now the Catholic priests come back and all the Catholics can support the government and the Catholic Church can support Napoleon. And then the priests can preach that from the altar on, on mass on Sunday, that the path to heaven, the path to salvation lies through the recruitment office. Uh, right. Go get recruited into the army and then go to heaven. Right. Which is the ultimate expression of Napoleon is, is that everything will be will be bent to the surface. Uh, the service of the state, right? Uh, and so again, Napoleon privately was totally anti-clerical. Expressed the common French, uh, French Revolution or Enlightenment sentiment that the Catholic priests are a bunch of obscurantist people speaking in mumbo jumbo, dead Latin to stupid fools about salvation, this and that. Uh, but publicly, it benefited him to 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 suggest that uh, the Catholic Church was okay. Uh, and so also Napoleon. Um, he, he reformed the French law code and he, he created um, the uh, the legal system uh, that underlie the French Revolution. Yeah. This is the this early, is the late, the early 1800s, like the first couple of years of the 19th century, like 1801, 1802. And, um, and so um, Napoleon reformed the law code and he made it rational. He thought, look, we got to have a law code people can understand. You got to get rid of all these dumb pre French Revolution laws. And he made this rational, modern, simple, comprehensible law code. And it was called the Code Napoleon. And the important thing about it is anywhere Napoleon conquered, the Code Napoleon went. And this was a big deal. It was like the French Revolution in a box. You just take it with you and you open it up and modernity comes out and is there. It's, it's just, it's, you have a question. Thank you. Um, and so um, the... The, the French Revolution sort of travels in Napoleon's backpack, right? And there's a huge divide in the history of European countries that Napoleon conquered. Thus, they, they had this modernity thrust upon them. And then European countries that Napoleon did not conquer and that they missed out on these changes. And it was a big deal. Napoleon abolished feudalism. He abolished uh, the old ways of doing things. He brought in this new law code. And the law code had with it the idea that like all law should be simple. The average person should know the law. Uh, the average person should be entitled to understand the law. The law should be represented clearly. The legal system should be done in courts with judges and you have, you know, witnesses and it's all fair and things. Those were new ideas in parts of Europe that feudalism, particularly the abolition of legal privilege. All people are people 
and the law applies equally to everybody. Now, of course, we know today that that's not always the case, but it's an ideal that the law had never had before, and Napoleon took it with him. And he said, the two things that I will be remembered forever for are the creation of the Legion of Honor and the Napoleonic Code. They will far outlive any memory anyone has of me. And he was right, uh, right? And dozens of countries have the Code Napoleon today, Senegal and Gambia and, um, and Algeria um, and Vietnam. Uh, uh, and Laos and Cambodia all have legal codes based on the Napoleonic Code. And one American state, actually, Louisiana, which was bought from Napoleon during the Napoleonic Wars by the American president, Andrew uh, Thomas uh, Jefferson, not Andrew Jackson, uh, Thomas Jefferson, actually has a civil law, not criminal law, but civil law based on the Napoleonic Code. It's why if you take the bar exam and you pass it, you can sometimes pass other state bar exams automatically, depending on if there's a reciprocal arrangement. Louisiana has no arrangements with any other state because Louisiana civil law is based on French civil law and it's not based on American and British common law. It's totally different. And so if you practice uh, law in Louisiana, it's wacky. Uh, it's wacky. Um, not, not criminal law. Criminal law is, is the same in Louisiana as in the other 49 states, but uh, civil law is different because uh, it's based on the Napoleon Code. And so uh, Napoleon is seen by a lot of people in Europe at this time as the sort of avatar of the French Revolution. Everybody sort of rationalizes. They're like, well, he's kind of a dictator, but, you know, like he represents the future. He's bringing the future to the, 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 um, uh, the you know, um, the rest of Europe. And there are these in, in the Western German states, west of Prussia, northwest of Austria, there are these revolutions. And the, the Germans, they want modernity. They don't want to live under the Holy Roman Empire, which has existed since the 900s. They want the modern age. They revolt and they cry out for Napoleon. You know, deliver us from medieval government and give us the modern age. And Napoleon is only too happy to oblige, right? And invades. Um, and he, he invades. But before then, we've got to mention Napoleon undergoes this, this most significant thing. Uh, he, he decides to just go ahead and call it what it is. If it has webbed feet and it quacks, it's a duck. So he crowns himself emperor of France. Uh, and, and for a lot of people, this is a big letdown. For other people, for some cynical people, they were like, <laughs> I mean, like, what a duck, right? On the other hand, a lot of idealistic people thought that Napoleon was sort of different than this, right? And so uh, uh, Beethoven is writing a symphony for Napoleon, the, uh, the, the heroic symphony, the Eroica, and he dedicates it to Napoleon, and then he's writing it. And when he hears the news that Napoleon just crowned himself emperor, he rips the dedication page out of the symphony and burns it. And he's like, I can't dedicate something to someone who would betray uh, us like that. I can't do it. So Napoleon crowns himself emperor. Josephine, to her great excitement, is crowned empress, right? They're, they're married, and, and they will be, she will be the empress. And the, um, the coronation is, is just, it's pure Napoleon. They, they have this elaborate ceremony. They design a crown. Uh, right, the crown falls out of the carriage and gets covered in mud, but they clean it up so no one can see because it's a bad omen. And they get to the the church, and it's a very imperial coronation. And Napoleon comes up, and they have a very elaborate ceremony. The Pope is there, and the Pope figures this is from Charlemagne action. I am the Pope will crown the emperor, thus creating the idea that the emperors are subordinate to the Pope. In the middle of the ceremony, Napoleon stops everything and puts the crown on his head, and he says, "No man will crown me. I place the crown on my own head. I elevate myself." Um, and the Pope is like, "Shh." Uh, right. And so it's very Napoleon to be like, no one tells me what to do. Um, and so then they, then Josephine comes out, she's going to be the empress and all of her, all of Napoleon's sisters are the bridesmaids and the, the sort of coronation attendants. And Josephine has a, a wedding dress train that's like 150 feet long and they're all get, they're all carrying it. And Josephine is kind of stately pr walking down the aisle. And in the middle of the aisle, Napoleon's sisters get in a shoving match over who will be the first of the coronation attendants. And so Josephine walks and all of a sudden she gets like pulled backward and almost falls over because they're not moving forward and she's like stuck on the train. And there's like a shoving match between the sisters who are pulling and finally like some ushers have to come up and like separate them. And Josephine just like stands there. Uh, she can't look back. She just stands there until they, someone tells her like it's okay. And she like walks forward again. And Napoleon's sisters kind of get their, like their, their act calmed down. Like they get like told to just shut up. Uh, so Napoleon's got this very fractious family. Uh, he rewarded his family with territories. If you were Napoleon's family and he conquered something, you would get it. Um, right. King of Spain. Sure. Uh, uh, Transalpine Gaul. Sure. Uh, Northern Italy. Yeah. Austria, whatever. Prussia's fine. Uh, Lucian was one of Lu Napoleon's brothers. He didn't like Lucian's wife. And he told Lucian, divorce your wife. She's a loser. And Lucian was like, I love her. And Napoleon's like, cool. Get the fuck out. Um, and he ne never talked to Lucian again. That was it. Um, right. And so moral of the story is when your brother's emperor of France and he tells you to ditch your wife, you should do it.
because that's how you become like king of Spain or some stupid crap. Uh, so um, Napoleon, what's that? King of Spain, yeah. Well, I mean, it's not going to be so great when you get, you know, sh shoved in front of a brick wall and shot in the face. Um, I mean, yeah, no, it was a couple years. It was all right. You know, I mean, whatever. Who else gets to be King of Spain, right? Uh, and so, who's it today? It's King of Spain today. It's not, it's, is it Alfonso? It's not Juan Carlos. He's, in, he's involved in some fraud because he's an idiot. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so, um, um, so Napoleon crowns himself emperor, and he crowns Josephine, and uh, and then he invades Germany, and this is this is this is the moment of Napoleon's simultaneous greatest victory and greatest defeat. They happen within the space of months of each other. Napoleon's greatest victory is the Battle of Austerlitz. The Prussians come in, the British are supporting everyone with money, the Austrians come in, everybody comes in to fight Napoleon. And they think they've got him. They meet at Austerlitz in Germany, and Napoleon mops the floor with them. Uh, right? That's him. He just defeats. It's like you can't beat this guy. He can't be defeated. Uh, he can't be killed. Uh, I can't be killed. I can't be killed. Uh, and so Napoleon, it's his greatest victory. And Napoleon, his soldiers called him. The, by the way, Napoleon was 5'8", as tall as I am. The British spread a rumor that he was short um, and thus had no self-confidence. And it's because the soldiers called him le petit corporal which in French is the little corporal, and they called him that because they loved him. And so after Austerlitz, Napoleon rode out in front of his men, he took off his hat, and he waved it. And in French, he said, Soldats, je suis content vendu. Uh, he said, Soldiers, I am content with you. I'm content with you. And they cheered because they loved Napoleon. He adopted every orphan that had been created as a result of a casualty at Austerlitz. He paid every widow who had been in widowed as a, a result of the Austerlitz a pension for the rest of her life. Um, and uh, he promoted a bunch of enlisted men officers on the field, um, and he captured the th millions of dollars worth of loot, muskets, and cannons and stuff. Um, and it was the the stuff with the or orphans and the widows was is pretty minor, but it was like hugely meaningful, right? The French government had never done things like that. Soldiers were not treated that way, and so Napoleon wins this victory uh, in uh, in uh, in um, uh, Germany, which is just beyond all imagining. And so from there, he goes to invade Prussia. And this is, this is when things get, get a little more real. But at the same time, there is the most important battle of the Napoleonic Wars. It takes place off the coast of Spain, uh, and it is in the, in the ocean. It is the Battle of Trafalgar. And of course, if you were to London, Trafalgar Square is named for this battle. The Spanish and French fleets um, are, uh, are united, and they're sailing out to attack who knows where. Um, and the, the British decide to ambush the fleet and sink it. Uh, because that's the threat to the British. They think if they can defeat the fleet, they can protect Britain from an invasion, a naval invasion. And so who's in command of the British Naval Squadron? It is, of course, Admiral Horatio Nelson. He's on the foredeck of his flagship, the HMS Victory. Uh, and so Nelson s gets everybody together and he says, the plan is this. We're going to do something. We're gonna, it's called crossing the T. The French Navy, Spanish Navy, they're going this way, right? They're going sort of north to south. The British are going to cut in the middle of the, the ships um, and as the as the French and the Spanish navies go north, the British are going to sail right in between them. The advantage is that the guns on the ships fire left and right off the sides of the ships. Well, the French and Spanish guns will be firing directly at the British ships, and they will be firing at a very narrow section of the ship. Whereas when the British ships get in between the Spanish and French ships, their all of their guns will be firing at a much wider profile. Right? They can turn and they can be they can be broadside in the enemy ships. Um, and Nelson tells the, the captains, I'm not going to tell you what to do. We're going to get the ships in position. We're going to close in as close as we can. Once the engagement is joined, you just, you just do what you, you just engage the targets of opportunity that you think. Uh, and, and he tells his gunners uh, to, for example, uh, wait until the, the ships rock. And he says, wait until our ships are, our ship is turning up. And then when you fire, you'll sweep the deck and the sails. Uh, do maximum, uh, maximum damage to the, the ships. And so uh, the Battle of Trafalgar is the most important naval battle in European history between maybe the Battle of Actium or Lepanto on one hand and uh, maybe Midway on the other in, in, terms of, in terms of its significance. It establishes the British as the supreme naval power. It's 1804. It establishes them as the supreme naval power until the summer of 1942 when the Americans defeat the Japanese at Midway. Um, and become the world's prominent naval power position they've held until the present day. 
Um, and so uh, what happens at, at – uh, and there's a great scene before um, uh, at Trafalgar. Nelson raises the semaphore flags, and it says um, – uh, it's and this is if you're in the British Navy, like this is the kind of thing that, that brings tears to their eyes. It says England confides that every man shall do his duty, and the last orders he gives to the British captain is engage the enemy more closely, more closely. Um, and so, what does Nelson do? He gets right up to the, the Spanish ships and the French ships. Uh, they he sees a couple ships, uh, and they they sweep the decks, uh, they dock out the sails, uh, they uh, they fire into the ship that's immobilized. They, uh, they tangle it up in the rigging. And uh, when the smoke clears at the end of the day in 1804, it's a decisive British victory. The Spanish and French fleets have been devastated. The British have suffered losses, but nothing as bad as the, the British and, and the uh, Spanish and French. Uh, but Nelson has been killed. Nelson was on the deck of the victory, um, and he gave his first mate some orders. And the guy turned around to give the orders to turn back, and Nelson was on, the, on his back on the, on the deck. And he said... Uh, I believe my backbone is shot through. A French sniper with a musket tied to the rigging of a ship had been waiting until they got close, um, and he shot Nelson in the back and killed. He bled to death on the deck of the Victory. And so, and if you go to Portsmouth, uh, as my lovely and talented executive producer has done, you can see on the deck of the Victory they have they have a plaque where he died. Um, and then the story goes that they took Nelson uh, below decks. They didn't bury him at sea because they knew he needed a, a state funeral. They needed a hero's funeral in England. So they toasted him. They took one of the rum barrels, and they t- you're going to love the story. They took a rum barrel, uh, and they everybody took a jigger rum and toasted the captain. And then they folded him up, and they put him in the rum barrel, and they sealed it up, and they took him back to England. And when they took him to England, they opened the rum barrel, and they took him out, and they had a funeral for him, and he's buried in a cathedral. And it was this, this incredible moment. He's a British national hero. And the story is that his officers went back on the ship and they took the barrel of rum and they drank the rest of the rum. They drank the Nelson. Uh, is, if you take drinks, a, if you, drinks, <laughs> drinks, drinks. if you go to Portsmouth, you can still take a tour of the HMS victory, or at least you could when I was there and I did that. Um, they have the barrel that they brought him back home with still in the, uh, if I, was, I would have gotten thrown off the ship, but it would have been worth it to touch the Nelson death body, dead body burial. I would. I mean, I would totally. I would totally have touched it. I, I did. I'm not. I. I did. I have broken that rule in museums before, and I don't have any regrets. No regrets. No. Regrets. No, no regrets. No. No. None at all. Uh, but yeah, that's the story. They did. The officers. They. They all poured uh, glasses of the Nelson uh, fer- fermenting preservation body preservation rum, and they drank it. They toasted. They toasted Nelson. Uh, a ball by rum. Yeah. Um, and so, and that was that was the story. And so. Uh, Napoleon wasn't at Trafalgar, but it was the most important battle because it solidified the kind of Mexican standoff of the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon had this huge army. The British couldn't touch him. Uh, he had no navy. The British had a huge navy. They had no army. So they could protect the seas, but they couldn't invade England. Uh, they couldn't invade Europe. They couldn't, they couldn't do anything to Napoleon. And so if, if, they, if the Napoleon invaded, he would win. But he doesn't have a navy, so he can't invade. If the British attacked Napoleon, they would lose. So uh, he can't get them, and they can't get him, and they're just kind of stuck, uh, right? And so Napoleon uh, invades uh, uh, Prussia, uh, right? Uh, remember, Prussia, 1600s, Prussia, the Sparta of the North, the most fearsome army ever, 1700s Prussia, uh, Frederick the Great. Uh, remember, Frederick the Great becomes, he writes a book about pacifism as a young man, and then his dad executes his gay lover in front of Frederick and makes Frederick watch. He had a soldier hold Frederick's eyes open and hold his head so he saw he saw his lover executed. Frederick uh, takes power and six months later picks a fight with the Austrians. And he says, when someone asks him, what justification do you use to go to war with Austria? He says, I will win and I will pay historians to come up with a justification later, uh, which they do. Uh, and that's Silesia, uh, right? And he, he sees Silesia from, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, Maria Theresa. Uh, and so uh, Frederick the Great, w- Napoleon, when he when he captured Berlin, by the way, he took his um, his men to Potsdam, to Frederick's palace and to Frederick's tomb. And he said, soldiers, if Frederick the Great was here, we would not be here. We would have been defeated. He was a man like no other. And so and Frederick the Great was a man like no other. It was the, it was, I love him unreservedly, but he's also one of the awfulest people in the history of Europe. He's such a horrible asshole. Uh, right. He got married and he was probably gay and he treated his wife better than I would treat like like. I don't know, like a, like a stray dog that it was like, I, I wouldn't even, tra- I would treat a stray dog good. I mean, I don't even know how to describe how bad Frederick treated his wife. Like, be- like if someone tried to kill me, I would probably treat them better than Frederick treated his wife. Um, who, and of course, it, 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 he was super gay. So I'm sure 
his thought was like, what do I, what do I need a woman for? Like, what's the point of it? Would you talk to a woman? What would you say to a woman? What would be like a conversation that you'd have with a woman? Did they like, do they, they like read or whatever? Um, I just want to clarify. He's not saying that all gay people are misogynist. He's just saying that Frederick but, but, yeah, the Great no, Fred, was misogynist. Frederick the Great was a, yeah, no, because like, no, you don't have to be a misogynist to be gay. Frederick the Great what, was a total misogynist. But to be fair to Frederick the Great, he was not so much a misogynist as he was uh, a misanthrope who hated all human beings equally, except for a small select number of people he thought were smart. And so it was just even more so. Like if it was a woman, it was it was even less you would like, even less reason to talk to this person. All right. And he felt bad for his wife. She was so like, oh, my God, we're going to be married and we're going to have a great life. And he was like, Ugh, like, mm, like, what if you just went away and never talked to me again or whatever? Mm. And he basically exiled her some house in the woods. It was like, just just I don't. Mm. Uh, and so military genius, not a nice person. Right. Uh, and so what can we say? Napoleon attacks the uh, the Prussians, defeats them. Uh, I want to say it's the Battle of Gina, I think. Uh, and he defeats the Prussians in two weeks, 14 days. Uh, 14 days to the defeat of the, the the single greatest military in Europe is brought low in two weeks by Napoleon, who is invincible. And Napoleon uh, in, in, in Berlin, he issues the Berlin Decree. Um, and uh, the British and the, the, the French thus is sort of um, like weaponize their um, their kind of like their, their fighting against each other. The Napoleonic system that Napoleon, the continental system Napoleon uh, creates, uh, if you are a Napoleonic subject or ally, uh, you cannot have business with the British. No, no, no trading. No, no, no commerce. Nothing. You've isolated the British completely from Spain, Portugal, Austria, Switzerland, Italy, France, the Low Countries, Germany. All of it. Uh, they will be isolated completely. The British, on the other hand, engage a blockade, uh, and they say any ship coming or going from Napoleonic for Europe will be stopped and sunk and defeated. Uh, right? And they maintain the blockade for like nine years or something like that. Uh, and it's hard. It's dirty. It's dangerous. It's difficult work. Uh, and a part of this blockade is the the, the, the British Navy. It's, it's not a very heroic day, but it is a really important thing. The, the British cripple the Napoleonic economy by preventing the European countries from attacking uh, the uh, from doing any, any business, any business with anybody. Any Amer And by the way, if you're an American history person, this is why the War of 1812 happens, is the, the increasing tension between the American desire to trade with the British and French and the, uh, the British blockade. Uh, causes incidents that culminate in, in uh, a war between England and America in 1812, uh, right? There was incident, the HMS Leopard stops the USS Chesapeake and they board it and they seize the cargo because uh, they think we're bound for, the, the ship is bound for France. Uh, and of course the American captain's like, I can go where I want. And the British guy's like, you can go where you want, except I'm powerful enough to stop you. So I stopped you. Uh, and Madison who's president. He said, if the, if the HMS Leopard had stopped the USS Chesapeake when Congress was in session, there would have been nothing to stop a war. Uh, he said the Congress would have voted to go to war that day, but because it was several months went by, Madison was able to like calm everybody down. Um, but it, it was eventually it was too much. It was by 1812, the American Congress, uh, the likes of John C. Calhoun and Henry Clay and Daniel Webster were too angry. Uh, what they saw was the high-handed way the British were bossing the Americans around, and so a war resulted, uh, which was not super great for America. Uh, right. So uh, what, what does Napoleon do? Well, he goes east uh, and he signs a deal with the single remaining European power that opposes him, Russia, and it's the Tsar, is Alexander, Tsar Alexander the uh, First. And if you if you've been here, if you've been here um, for uh, 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 our videos, you will remember the first video we did uh, talked about um, Nicholas the Second, whose dad was Alexander the Third, and his grandfather was Alexander the Second. This is Alexander the First. Uh, right. And so it's uh, it's Alexander the first, Nicholas the first, Alexander the second, Alexander the third, Nicholas the second. And so it's, it's, it's the same. And, and Nicholas is Nicholas the first is Alexander the first's brother uh, because he doesn't have a son. So Alexander the first comes to um, uh, eastern Germany and they actually uh, they build a barge in the middle of the river. Uh, and it's at a place called Tilsit. Um, and uh, they they agree to meet in. Um, Oh, what are you asking? Oh, I don't know. She's being. That's okay. Thank you for being considerate. Um, and so, um, uh, they meet in the middle of the river at Tilsit, and they build a little platform in the middle. And the idea is that the, the dividing line between Russian and, and Prussian territory is right in the middle of the river. So they build a barge 
and they anchor it over the middle of the river and they build a table that is divided completely by the, the line. It's like if you go to the North South Korea DMZ, there's a building in the DMZ that the table is halfway North Korea, halfway South Korea. So the Americans and North Koreans can sit at the table and they can meet like the line. There's like a sash in the middle of the table that is the border, right? So apparently the story is they build this barge and Napoleon shows up first. He goes over to the Russian side. And when the Russian emperor is being rowed over in a boat, Napoleon is like welcoming him to the, his side of the barge. And it's like this calculated insult uh, that Napoleon is like, oh, I got here first. Welcome to my barge. And the Russian emperor is like, it's supposed to be shared. And so Napoleon tells the emperor, uh, let's have a deal. I don't want to fight. French, the Russian emperor says, okay. Uh, and the Russian emperor becomes a Napoleonic ally. Uh, and what happens? Uh, they join the continental system. Uh, right, they, they they become Napoleon's allies. So to make a long story short, the British find themselves in a terrible position. They have used as allies the Spanish, failed. The Italians fail. The Austrians fail. The Danish fail. The Russians fail. The Prussians fail. So it's like I guess we're going to have to do this ourselves. I guess we're going to have to do this ourselves. So two things begin to happen. The continental system begins to kind of peel apart when people realize that it's impossible for Napoleon to enforce this. Right, he can't he can't have inspectors in every port all the time. Right. And the next thing is, it's so far away, right? St. Petersburg, a port, Russia's only warm water port, is like 5,000 miles away or whatever from uh, Paris, right? At the same time, the British begin to land troops in, um, in Europe. They go, the weak spot is Portugal, uh, right? And so Arthur Wellesley, who becomes the first Duke of Wellington, um, right, beef Wellington is named supposedly for the way he liked his beef cooked. Is this where the name? Um, and so, I mean, it's all right. It's all right, I guess. Um, uh, and so Wellington uh, lands troops in Portugal, and he liberates Portugal and begins to infiltrate uh, British troops into Spain and causes an uprising against the Napoleon-backed monarchy of Spain. And the local Spaniards, they don't like the French-backed king of Spain. They revolt, and there's there's a guerrilla warfare breaks out all over the Spanish peninsula. The term guerrilla uh, in Spanish, it's it's not spelled gorilla, G-O-R, with the, like the, the, the primates. It's spelled G-U-E-R-I-L-L-A, guerrilla. It means in Spanish, little war. The word for war in Spanish is guerra. Uh, so this means guerrilla is a little warrior. And what breaks out over the Spanish peninsula is a little war. Uh, constant uprisings against the, the French. Napoleon has to send more and more troops to put down the uprising, uh, and the British begin supplying the locals with weapons. They begin sneaking troops in and fighting back here and there. It's the first time that British troops and French troops begin to fight in the Napoleonic Wars. It's very important. So the other thing that happens is Napoleon begins to uh, realize that his allies are peeling away from him, and the leader of the pack is Alexander, who suddenly realizes aligning himself with an anti-Christian emperor from france is like not really a great idea and also at the end of the day you can just do whatever you want I mean, what's napoleon going to do right so napoleon uh threatens his ambassadors threaten the russian emperor they say look you know our master has seven hundred and fifty thousand soldiers do you want him to invade and alexander basically says how about a little bit of that right i mean maybe try some of that and so napoleon in 1812 resolves that this situation cannot he has to do something uh the, the blockade the british blockade is hurting him the, the, the uprising in Spain is hurting him, but the, the best thing you can do is invade Russia, stomp the Russians, end this, uh, bring, bring them to their knees, and demonstrate the, the resolve of the, um, of the Napoleonic regime. So Napoleon does. Uh, right. By the way, also Josephine out. Uh, she's a loser, and instead he asked the Austrians for a princess. Uh, and the Austrians are like, no. And the Russians are like, oh, a Romanov princess? Uh, we'll call you later. And so Napoleon ends up marrying a Polish princess. Uh, we should mention, by the way, Napoleon was sort of a, a weird guy. Uh, his favorite meal was uh, full chicken that you would pluck the uh, feathers, stick it on a spike, cook it over a fire, uh, which is is like soldier camp food, right? I mean, it's like rotisserie chicken, um, right? And that would be what he would eat all the time. And he was the kind of guy who would work so constantly that he would not eat unless you brought him food. And if you asked him, what do you want? He's like, just cook me a chicken. I don't, I don't care. Uh, I don't just give me some chicken or something. And so there would be these state dinners and Napoleon would be like bored or like wanting to read paperwork or whatever. He's like a workaholic. Um, and so he was this kind of totally interesting person. Goethe, the German philosopher, went and met him. And it was this big thing. Goethe would come as an emissary of all the Enlightenment Germans to meet this new consul in France. And Napoleon met him and he hugged Goethe. And he said to Goethe, the only book I took with me 
when I invaded Egypt uh, was uh, Das Leiden des Jungenwerther, The Sorrows of Young Werther, the, the great book by Goethe, the romantic novel by, by Goethe. And Goethe was like, it was the fakest bullshit I have ever seen. It was like, it was like when you go meet someone, uh, when somebody famous, like when the president or something meets an author, and they're like, I loved your book. Uh, name of your book, right? And it was like, it was so obvious Napoleon wasn't really a, a cultured person. And so uh, also uh, the, the Polish princess, her name is Maria something or other. Um, she was this very sort of timid, shy young woman. Napoleon was one of those people who would walk everywhere, almost about to break into a run. Like he would, they would, he'd be like, I need to go visit this thing. And he would like walk really fast. And because walking is wasted time, right? If you could just run everywhere, it would be faster. And when the princess would sort of do like a stately walk because she's a princess, Napoleon would run up behind her and smack her on the ass and scream, go faster. And, and she would shriek and burst into tears uh, because they would be like walking and she would be like trying to be dignified and he would be like about to run and he would just smack her and scream. And so she spent a lot of time crying because Napoleon was apparently like a difficult guy to deal with. So 1812, uh, it's the, the, the rush is called the Great Patriotic War, the single greatest event in Russian history up to this point. Napoleon invades. Uh, it unites the entire Russian population behind the czar. Uh, they retreat. Why do they retreat? Uh, they don't have the soldiers to fight Napoleon. Their armies are not sufficient yet. They're not ready. So they retreat, they retreat, they retreat. Napoleon advances 10 miles, 100, 200, 300. They go and they go and they go and they go and they go. And they finally fight a battle in Western Russia at a place called Borodino. And the Russians, is a tie. But the Russians retreat, Napoleon pursues. And finally, Alexander makes a grave decision. Uh, he abandons the capital of Moscow. It's a wooden city. It's all woods, all wood buildings. They burn it to the ground. And Napoleon and his men are running out of food. The Russians are killing the livestock. They're driving the animals before them. They're emptying the villages. The peasants are disappearing into the woods. There's no food. There's no water. When they get to Moscow, they will have food. And all of a sudden, they come over the hills, and they come to the edge of the town, and they can see this red glow on the horizon, and his city is burning. Moscow's burning. Alexander retreats. And so Napoleon takes command of his army in Moscow. It's freezing cold. The winter's beginning to come in. And what happens? Uh, he has to retreat. They have to turn around. And so the first time in Napoleon's history, he admits some kind of defeat. Uh, right? Egypt. I don't even remember Egypt. I don't even remember anyone. No one's asking about that. I forgot what happened. And so Napoleon uh, retreats back. His army falls apart and disintegrates, spreads out over this wide area as they approach the borders of uh, Russia. And along the way, his army is harassed by Russian soldiers. The Cossacks, the Ulhans come out of the freezing wind and rain. Uh, they had to, if you fall behind, you're dead. Uh, soldiers huddled together at night around a small fire. We wake up in the morning. The guys on the outside are all dead. They're all frozen. If you're wounded, you get left behind and butchered by the Cossacks. And when they finally reach the edge of French territory, most of the army's dead. And the Russians are right behind them. Uh, right? And so this is 1812 that Tchaikovsky famously wrote his, his uh, uh, overture about. Uh, Tchaikovsky hated it, by the way. Um, because it was thought it was the most puerile thing. It was, he said it was a stupid nationalist bullshit. Uh, but when the Germans invaded, um, and the, the Russians knew that something was on when they canceled everything in Moscow and the radio began playing the 1812 overture on repeat uh, because Stalin wanted to tell people that 1941 is the same as 1812. And he even called the German invasion of the Soviet Union the Great Patriotic War, which is the same thing that Alexander called the Napoleonic invasion. And the single greatest piece of Russian art in history is the novel uh, Dovnet Mir, uh, War and Peace uh, by uh, Leo Tolstoy. What's it about? It's about the single most important thing that ever happened, the meeting of the old world and the new world when Russia was invaded by Napoleon, when, when Russia was invaded. And that's, what, that's, the, that's the backdrop for Tolstoy's uh, sort of epic novel about basically everything in history, right? So Napoleon reaches the borders of his empire he learns that there is an uprising in France. He is to be overthrown. He retreats uh, all the way back to France, raises an army. And this time, everybody's all in. All of, his, all of his subjects revolt. The Austrians, the Italians, the Spanish, the British are here. The Russians are coming. Everybody's there. The Prussians are there. And Napoleon fights a battle in the Battle of the Nations. He fights in Germany. What does he do? He wins. Can't lose. Uh, he wins. It's an amazing battle. It's the most unbelievable thing. He wins. And no one can believe it. The entire world is against Napoleon. He wins. Uh, now, the problem with Napoleon, he retreats back to Paris. There's no more soldiers. That's it. There's no more French people. There's no more allies. All of the, sold, the countries he was recruiting from, they're his enemies. All the French people, they're done. They've been at war for 25 years. They're exhausted. Napoleon said, remember, eventually the French people will tire at me. They will not glance at me a second time if I do not give them something to look at. And that's it. They're done. 
And so Napoleon realizes his back is against the wall. And this, this is it. Um, and so uh, he uh, agrees to abdicate, uh, right? He agrees to go into exile, um, right? He, he, he's got a child uh, with his princess, Napoleon II, the little baby. Uh, if Napoleon II can become emperor of France, he will abdicate. And a council, a huge gathering is called in Vienna under the auspices of the Austrian emperor and his, um, his foreign minister, Clemens von Metternich, the spider. They call Metternich the, the spider. Uh, and so uh, someone asked Metternich who would rule Italy. And Metternich said, who would rule Italy? Why would anyone want to? Uh, which is like, Whoa, it's beautiful. Uh, and so having said that, Metternich puts together the, the Congress of Vienna. All of the rulers of Europe, minus France, come together to figure out how to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. What are we going to do about the pre-Napoleonic, pre-French Revolution order? How are we going to go back to how it was, right? The czar, the English king, the, the Austrian emperor, they're all there, uh, right? And so Napoleon says to the Congress of Vienna, I'll abdicate, put my son on the throne, everything is fine. So Napoleon goes into exile on an island in the Mediterranean called Elba. Right. We're done with this guy. He's gone forever. We'll never hear from him again. That's it. Right. That's great. And so the Congress of Vienna sets about meeting in Vienna, trying to figure out what to do. They're not going to punish France. They're going to give France back its territories from 1789. If you punish France, it will become vengeful and vindictive. It will lead to another war, a lesson that we didn't learn in 1918, unfortunately. <coughs> Joe Wilson is the worst. Uh, but um, that's the idea. Uh, and uh, Metternich envisions an idea called the balance of power where all the European countries are roughly equal in power. And if any country would try to aggregate to itself great power like Napoleonic France, then what would happen is that they would be defeated by all the other countries, would come together to defeat him. And so uh, Napoleon uh, it goes to exile. His son will be deposed. They will put Louis the Sixteenth's brother on the throne, Louis the Eighteenth. Louis, the Louis the Sixteenth was executed in 1793. His son uh, Louis Joseph the Dauphin was executed uh, in prison a year later. He died. The little boy is a little boy is like 13. He died in prison. So Louis's brother, Le Duc de Orléans, uh, comes in as Louis the Eighteenth. Uh, he got one more brother who will come in as Charles the Tenth later. Louis the uh, uh, the Eighteenth is put on the throne, so we're going to restore the Bourbon monarchy. Everything's fine. We're all fine. It's back to normal. Everything's back to normal. Does anyone remember how bad the past twenty five years have been? I don't remember how bad it is. It sounds great, awesome. And so then, what happens is Napoleon hears about all this. He hears his son is deposed, and so he goes on Elba, and his supporters are there, and they engineer his escape. Right? Napoleon goes for a tour of the dock at Elba, and then he's gone. He's on a fishing boat. And everybody in France has abandoned their Napoleonic, their stuff. They're just, it's over. It's, oh, I guess it's it. No more Napoleon. And Napoleon shows up in southern France. And there begins a period in history that is uh, called the Hundred Days, which is this almost electric moment. Napoleon shows up again and says, Frenchman, I am back. And the French, they were done with Napoleon in 1814 when he came back from, from Russia. But now they realize that they lost, right? The war is over and they lost. So all of a sudden, when Napoleon shows up and says, I've returned. All the French people are like, Whoosh! there's under their clothes is the Napoleonic uniform, right? The soldier uniform. And the, um, it's like uh, if the choice is Napoleon and uh, winning with Napoleon and losing, then their previous reservations are gone. I, I love, I always love Napoleon. He's the best. Let's win together. All right. And so Napoleon mysterious, an army just appears. It's like, it's like sewing the dragon teeth. The soldiers pop out. And so all of a sudden the British and the Austrians are like, that's pretty good how we beat Napoleon, right? That fucking guy. Clean glasses, boom, did it. All right, I think we're all done here. Wrap it up, uh, right? And then someone comes in and is like, all right, everybody, uh, Napoleon is back from exile with a bigger army. And everybody's like, are you kidding? Like, that's, I mean, that's a good joke. And they're like, uh, no, no, like it's for real. So Napoleon marches to France, uh, up to Paris. He gets his army back and uh, he knows he's got to have a showdown. There's uh, three armies converging. It's uh, the uh, uh, the the British under um, uh, Wellington. It is the uh, Russians uh, and it's the Prussians under Marshal Blucher. And Napoleon knows if he beats them, that's it. He wins. They, they, he's proven he can, literally can't be beaten. If he loses, this is it. And so they meet in 1815 on a field in Belgium, Waterloo, uh, right? Waterloo. Uh, and so and, and Napoleon, he almost wins. He almost wins. He stops the British army stone cold. And it is only the arrival of the Russians and the Prussians at the last minute that turns the tide. And Napoleon's soldiers 
uh, almost they almost capture the Napoleon's guard, his famous guard, almost capture uh, the uh, the British center of the line. They almost break the British line, um, and and he but he barely loses. And so Wellington famously said of Waterloo, he said it was the nearest run thing you ever saw in your damn life. Um, and he said, uh, and of course, famous quote from from uh, Hawk is going to like this. Uh, at the beginning of Waterloo, it was Wellington who said, uh, "It's what did he say?" Uh, he said, uh, so, so, it'll, so it'll be a pounding. Let's see who pounds longest. Uh, right. And uh, so in uh, the epigraph to John Bolton's recent book about the Trump administration, he quoted, quoted Wellington in the, in the, in the thing. Uh, and so uh, Napoleon loses Waterloo. It's an, if he had won in that day in Belgium, I, you, I don't even know, but he lost. And so the, the Congress of Vienna resumes the every we can, we can go back to carving up Europe. Napoleon goes into exile under the auspices of the British to a little island in the South Atlantic called St. Helena, uh, where he spends the rest of his life in this kind of sad, kind of pathetic exile. There's two British ships constantly patrolling the island to prevent a ship from coming or going without permission. Napoleon cannot leave. He can't, can't get French newspapers. Josephine dies uh, married to someone else. Um, the Polish princess has her marriage with Napoleon, you know, annulled. Um, and Napoleon dies in 1821. Uh, and probably of stomach cancer, a persistent conspiracy theories, the British slow poisoned him with arsenic in the wallpaper of the house where he lived. Um, although it's probably just stomach cancer. Um, but yeah, and it, arsenic apparently was in everything, dyes and stuff. So it's, it was not uncommon for people to get that. And so uh, it was a sad end to Napoleon. And so what did Napoleon do? He united the entirety of the European continent for the first time since Charlemagne and the last time until Adolf Hitler. Uh, he united a majority of the European continent. He brought the French Revolution to everything from the Atlantic coast to the border of Russia. Uh, countries like Poland, Prussia, Austria, Italy, Switzerland, uh, Spain, Portugal, they all had their countries, economies, political systems modernized. Napoleon overthrew dynasties that mattered nothing to him. He cared nothing for tradition. He brought the modern age to people, which was a huge thing. He abolished the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire had dated from the Middle Ages until 1804 when Napoleon abolished it, paving the way for an era of uncertainty in German politics that would lead, uh, as uh, Anila Lahiri wanted to hear about, to the rise of a united Germany in the 1870s. Out of the fragmented former Holy Roman Empire, you ended up with the competing power centers of Austria and Prussia. And then uh, uh, Prussia ended up becoming the, the focus of a unified Germany. And so Napoleon was, was, in a way, the midwife of modernism in European history, um, right? And of course, uh, it, it was just his, his you know, he was, not successful in unifying Europe in the long term, the, the modern, uh, the father of modern European politics, um, ultimately, right? And of course, Nelson goes down in history as the British hero. Wellington, the victor of uh, well, Waterloo, goes on to become prime minister in the 1820s. Not a good prime minister, as it turns out. He failed to pass the Great Reform Bill until the king basically made him pass it. Uh, but of course, uh, that that's that's that, right? Uh, and so uh, uh, that is that's Napoleon. Uh, right. Uh, I, I'm the most probably one of the most fascinating men in 19th century Europe, which is itself quite a fascinating age. Yeah. Do we have questions? No questions about Napoleon. Nobody. This this thing with the hand in the jacket was apparently a common thing. That was not a Napoleon thing. It was just a thing people did for portraits. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what? The same way that people do Snapchat. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. With duck face and. Yeah, it's yeah. just it was just a thing that people did with their hands to be in portraits. Yeah, it makes me look cool. So. Yeah, it makes me look, yeah, it makes me look cool. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sad no one has a question about Napoleon. Now I know about my now I know how my graduate school professor Peter Bergman felt when he would constantly try to get us to read books about Napoleon and no one would do it except me. Yeah, I agreed one time. He was thrilled. Yeah, it was a good book too. He made me read. Uh, it's a book called Napoleon's Integration of Europe. I got him. I think Wolf was last name. It's a good book. So if you're interested in Napoleon, the best history of the Napoleonic Wars is by um, uh, Harvey. I think his name is Steve Harvey. It's called The War of Wars, I want to say. Um, and the best biography of Napoleon is uh, recently there's one by uh, Alan Schoem did one a few years ago. It's in French. But the best one recently has been Andrew Roberts, um, who did a good one, Napoleon. He did a good one also about Churchill. Uh, but his Napoleon biography was excellent. Um, there is a great book by Levin, Dominic Levin, about the French uh, campaigns in Russia. Um, uh, Russia it's called Russia Against Napoleon. Uh, there's a two-volume biography of Nelson that you can get. I forget the name. There's a great book called Heroism at Trafalgar about the naval battles. 
uh, that you can read. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt wrote an es excellent study about the fighting in the U.S. Naval War against the British in War of 1812. Alan Taylor wrote an excellent history of the War of 1812 uh, in, uh, in America. Um, the, uh, there's a good biography of Wellington by Richard Holmes, who also wrote an excellent book called Redcoat about the British Army during the 1700s, 1800s, uh, which was superb. Um, and so, uh, uh, French Revolution, Carlyle wrote a great history. Um, uh, Edmund Burke wrote The Reflections of the Revolution of France. Uh, Simon Schama wrote The Excellent Citizens. Uh, Antonio Frazier wrote the superb uh, uh, biography of um, Marie Antoinette called The Journey, which is really good. Um, Timothy Tackett wrote a really stellar book called The, the King Takes Flight about Louis' uh, flight to Varennes. Uh, there's a really good book called Oh, what's it called? I can't remember. It's about the British. Um, it's about the British uh, during the Napoleonic Wars. I don't remember the name of it. And then also it was, um, there's a good biography of Pitt the Younger by one of uh, David Cameron's uh, former cabinet ministers, William Hague. William Hague wrote a really good biography of um, uh, Pitt the Younger, uh, which was uh, which was superb. Uh, right. And so just remember no, Napoleon. He deserves it. He was, uh, was a kick-ass guy. Uh, right. Um, so if there's no questions. Then we will see you next week. Remember, uh, comment, subscribe, like. Uh, we appreciate everybody who watches. Uh, we're thrilled to have you guys as fans and, and audience, also to our live audience. Thank you. Um, drinks. Um, and if you have a suggestion for a topic, if you have a suggestion for a topic, please uh, don't hesitate to comment. Anila, I hear your topics. Uh, uh, you, 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 the German nationalism is real. I, I don't know if I can do it when I'm drunk. And the Easter Rising, I don't, I don't know enough about, but I have book, I have books about it. I will read the books. We will revisit. Uh, we will, we will come back. Uh, we will talk about it. Uh, my mom suggested the Reformation. Uh, that's a good one. We might do that one because let's, let's butcher some people that disagree with us slightly over religion. Um, and uh, somebody, uh, Cindy suggested the Henry VIII. We talk about Henry VIII sometime uh, because uh, we like Henry VIII. Thumbs up. All right, high five. Thank you. All right, so as Matt mentioned, uh, like, comment, share, subscribe, you know, get your friends to watch this. We have a lot of fun doing it, but it's a lot more fun also if we know for certain that people are watching it. Um, PM us if you need recommendations on books on certain topics, oh, yeah, because absolutely. even if Matt doesn't actually know it, he's got the book in his library. Yeah. And um, if you are somewhat local to us, if you know where we are, Matt's classes for the fall semester start coming up soon, and you can PM us for more. PM us for more information on that also, because if you like his lectures, you can actually get credit for them. Okay, and this is Olivia. <laughs> so, and don't forget to ring the bell so we know that you subscribe. <laughs> what she said. <laughs> All right, we'll see you next time. <laughs>